Good morning, everyone. We will be starting in about two minutes. So if you guys can please make your way to your seats and please silence your cell phones. Again, we will be starting in about two minutes. So please make your way to your seats and silence your cell phones. Staying on? No, not you. It's me and him. Cause, cause we're playing for Canadian, but we're gonna stay on. Again. Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and stand as we start worship this morning.
Amen, church. You may be seated. Good morning, Antelope Valley Church. Good morning. Good morning to those and welcome that you're listening online or whether you're here in person. My name is Wendell and this is my bride, Buki. Thank you all for being here this morning. And I'd like to read a scripture. This is in Psalms 100, verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Most of us have families that we were born into. However, this is a voluntary family. And when I look out at this audience, um, I'm looking at uh, people like Todd and Julie that were with me when I proposed to Buki. Um, I'm looking at uh, Robert Simmons and Leslie who counseled me as a single. I'm looking at Bruce McPherson, one of the brothers who uh, studied the Bible with me. I think about Dave Owens. Think about Dr. Greg Moretzky, who's been such a big part of my life. I think about Morris, who's been with me in times of trouble. So this is my family, a family that follows God, a family of Christ. And I can't forget Tony, Mr. Why Not. <laughs> now, welcome to all of you, and I hope you have a, a great worship service with us today. I would hope that you would come back. And uh, my wife, Buki, also has a few words of welcome for you. Good morning, ladies. Welcome. If this is your first time coming or if you're a regular, we welcome you. As my husband said, I came from another ministry out here and I've been welcomed. Um, people like um, I call her Miss uh, Wanda welcome me. Uh, a lot of people, Leslie, um, Julie, a lot of people I felt welcome in the 10 years that I've been here. It'll be 10 years that I've been here ten, next month. And it's been like family. So if you are a lady, you're visiting here, you're looking for a fellowship, this is the right place to be. Um, and I would like to um, read from Proverbs 31:30, and it talks about charm is flittering, beauty fades, but a woman who loves the Lord is truly praiseworthy. So let's dive into this adventure of faith and fellowship together. Welcome for worshiping with us today. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we continue worship. a name above every other name 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. I am Bruce McPherson, and um, I've been a member of this church and a disciple of Jesus Christ for a long time. So, this time each Sunday morning, we take bread, which represents Jesus' body, and we drink the cup, which represents Jesus' blood. We do this weekly as a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Now we're entering into our season of missions contribution. And that got me thinking about 34 years ago when I first became a disciple of Jesus Christ. I know I don't look that old. All right, maybe I do. All right. So I was in London going to graduate school, and actually I just finished graduate school, and I was working, and as I was walking past the Camden Town tube station, a guy named Joe Willis walked up to me, and he said, hey, mate, and I thought he wanted directions, but he was inviting me to Bible talk. Walked right up to me, didn't, had never known him, never met him before in my life, and he invited me to Bible talk. And strangely, I said, yeah, I'll go. So I went to Bible talk, and then after that, I started going to church, which I hadn't been to church in many, many years, because it, it was too early on Sunday mornings for me. And then after I started going to church, I started to study the Bible in a set of series of personal Bible studies. And then, those Bible studies brought me to faith in Christ, and I was baptized into a new life in Horley, England, which is south of London. Now, I would like to read a passage to you. It's in Romans 6, and I'm going to start in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live at it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been unified, united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. This passage to me is what communion is all about. Is remembering Jesus' death, his sacrifice for us, and our response to it, and the ability to have that new covenant in his blood, and the ability to have eternal life. So, one or two of you, at least I did, said, all right, that's great. What does mission contribution have to do with that? Well, for me, our London church 
was a mission church. That's where I was baptized. And had a group of people not gotten together and sacrificed their money and time and effort, that church would never have been planted. And I fear I never would have come to faith and found God. So this is very personal for me because I believe at the very least the London church that those people sacrificed was for me. It was planted for me. And I know it was planted for many other people as well. So our mission's contribution, which is coming up in several weeks, we're going to be supporting many things, and Steve's going to go over a few of those later on in the service today. But mostly, our money will go to supporting the Baltic and Nordic churches. Of course, we have Elias, who's representing the Baltic church. He's going to preach for us today. Awesome. And uh, we do that support through the Baltic Nordic Missionary Alliance or the BNMA. Now, what's really cool, at least for me, is that we had our annual BNMA meeting here this Friday and Saturday, yesterday and the day before, at the Antelope Valley Church building. And it was awesome. And we had brothers and sisters from all the supporting churches. We have supporting churches in Washington State, the Midwest, as well as Southern California, down in L.A., and of course ourselves. And we all gathered here to discuss the plans for next year. And they are exciting plans. I have to tell you, I was more excited this year than I've been in past years. And um, I know it's just weird. But the thing is, with the money that we give, the church in Riga is going to be able to hire a young married couple into the ministry. Now think about that. This is the future generation going into the ministry in a mission church that we're supporting. To me, that's just incredible. We're also going to be able to continue to support uh, ministers in Helsinki along with their enthusiastic young interns. It's awesome. Maintain the support with that. And then another uh, exciting thing is that um, we'll be able to send campus students from the U.S. over to the Nordic and Baltic churches for training this summer. And that's just the beginning. There's a whole lot more that's going to be done, but I thought those were some of the most exciting things. So now, our support for the mission churches in the Baltics and Nordics, if you think of it like this, will help a future Bruce McPherson. So I introduced myself. Will help a future Bruce McPherson come to faith in Christ and live a new life. So as we take communion this morning, let's consider Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us and how it has changed our lives and how we can help change the lives of others. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for this opportunity that we have each week to remember Jesus, his body and his blood that was given for us. Father, we pray that as we take this communion, that we can draw closer to you in every way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay. Now, as is our custom, we take up our weekly contribution. And you were thinking, hey, he was just talking about a missions contribution. And if he came last week, we did a benevolence contribution. And we have our weekly contribution. And you're thinking, I think this way. I might be the only one. Is that's a lot of contributions. Well, it is and it isn't. The reason why we do this is because we want to make sure when you give that you know precisely where the money is going and what it's being used for. So last week we talked about benevolence contribution that goes to help the poor. Our mission contribution, as I talked earlier, goes to help missions. Our regular weekly contribution, you may be asking, what does that do? Well, I will tell you what it does. What our weekly contribution does, it keeps the operations, the ongoing operations of our church on a regular basis happening. So our ministry staff, all the wonderful things we have to, to help our worship, all of that comes from, the large majority of that comes from our regular weekly contribution. So that's what we're giving to right now. So let's go ahead and pray, and um, we will take up the contribution. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to give. We pray that the money that we give will have a powerful impact in our church, in our community, and will help others to come to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A few announcements uh, for us before our incredible uh, missionary, Elias Saba, comes and uh, preaches to us today and shares about the uh, Baltic and Nordic work. Uh, this week will be a women's midweek at 7 o'clock. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who signed up for next Saturday's uh, respite event, our AV Foster Friends event. It's going to be incredible. We have a few more spots if you didn't get a chance to uh, sign up. Uh, so our remaining sign-up sheets are out after service. Uh, you do need to be screened, so fill out a screening form if you haven't done that uh, last fall and uh, so that you're cleared to work with the kids. Uh, but we'll meet you out, some of the staff, to uh, sign up and uh, finish that. It's going to be an incredible day. It'll be 79 degrees next Saturday, and uh, we're going to show those kids a good time. Amen. Uh, the fundraiser today is Manny's Brisket. So uh, uh, $12 a plate is going to be incredible. I had that brisket last year. It's something special. Uh, small group leaders meeting in the fellowship hall to follow with Elias is going to be sharing a little bit more. Uh, there's a marriage strengthening class that begins this Saturday. See the Cuffies or the Goins if you'd like to join that. Spanish service will be having their own service next Sunday, uh, so that's exciting. And finally, today is the last day for men's retreat announcement because it's the last day to sign up. I know a lot of us like really like the pressure of that last minute. So 12 p.m. tonight, you know, get on your phone by 11.50 p.m. Get signed up because you don't want to miss it. Steve and Kyle Lounsbury are putting together an incredible weekend for us of father-son sharing, and uh, we're going to have incredible activities up there in the mountain. Uh, finally, want to uh, just share uh, about Elias for, for a moment. He became a Christian five years ago in the Stockholm Church, and uh, he has been uh, serving in the ministry the last three years. So he's been trained in the fire, and uh, he's uh, just a really, as you'll find out, just a really genuine brother. He's easy to fall in love with. Uh, he's going to give his heart today. Uh, let's give our heart to him as he preaches to us, and he'll be coming up immediately after a video. Amen.
Hello, everyone. Greetings from the Nordic churches. It's, uh, it's really cool to be here. Thank you so much for your hearts, for your, for your wallets, for all this, this money and things you're giving. I know it doesn't grow on trees, so I want to say it's really appreciated over there in the Nordics and in the Baltics. Uh, so really gratitude. Gra so grateful for, for that. Um, so before I, I wanted to go through some highlights from the Nordic churches. As you can see, I'm, uh, I'm a pure Swede. I have blue eyes, blonde hair. All I need is the Viking helmet. And uh, there you go. Uh, so I'm typically, typically Swede, as you can tell. But I'm born in Sweden. My parents are from Jordan and Palestine. And, uh, and, uh, and they came over to Sweden. My, I was born there, raised outside the country, and came back for university. And since then, I've been pretty much in Sweden. Uh, so, yeah, I used to be in sales, I worked as a teacher, I worked in, uh, in the oil field industry, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and then I became a pastor. Started with the teens, and now I'm, I'm helping lead a small church, serve in a small church of 28 people, 28 disciples. It's, it's really cool how God works, I must say. Uh, so, it's a very interesting culture, Sweden. Sweden is very atheistic. It's, uh, it's really... It's really a different mission field than over here. And it was really cool this morning in the Bible, Bible study. The culture makes a difference in how we approach people and how we, how we talk about Christ. Uh, so it's, just it's important for you guys to know, even if it's built on Christian values, it's very, it's very atheistic in nature. So, uh, yeah, let's go on with the presentation here. Click down here. So Sweden, that's where, that's where I'm from, the blue and yellow. We have uh, three different cities in Sweden, three locations. As you see, those Uppsala is at the top there, Stockholm in the middle, and Södertälje, that's where I serve. We have, uh, it started all the way back in 1986. Uppsala was 2015, and in Södertälje it started in 2018. They actually started without any full-time staff, so I just recently joined around six months ago. They've been doing their own, own work. Let's look at a few... Uh, few different uh, slides in Uppsala, for example. Uppsala is a house church. It's, um, it's truly a family that has just opened their plate. And, uh, and like you can see there on the, on the screen, we have, we have a, a living room where people join. And it's a student city. Um, an amazing story there is we had a baptism by Leon over there. And uh, we could play the video, if possible, for Leon's baptism. So you can tell, in the ice. So, uh, yeah, there you go, in the ice, guys. We take it seriously over there. Leon, uh, Leon is actually from the Netherlands, and he had a, a Christian background, came to our church in Stockholm first, and he said, I want to join you guys. How do I do this? So we did the Bible studies, and it continued up in Uppsala with the Linfeld family. They helped out, and we have a new brother in Christ. So, amen. It's an unusual story because it's usually mostly atheists in the country, but... Leon from the Netherlands, entrepreneur. All right, so let's continue on to Stockholm. Uh, so Stockholm is led by Victoria and Shane McDowell. Um, it's, it's also, it's, it's really great working with them. I've been working for them, with them for the past three years. They're doing a great job up there. We have three marriages and three babies born um, up there. So that's, so that's always nice. Last year we had the... the Matthias and Abby Arvidsson, Daniel and Ida Sandström, and Olafur and Anna L. Johansson. I see here the pictures are kind of mixed in together there. But what you see at the front, if I were to say these guys, there are deacons, Tobias and Anna Lindberg. And up here we have Rasmus and Gunve Lind, as well as Christopher and Bovisa Lindfeldt, who are our team shepherds currently. So they're, they're decided to help out a bit more, give a bit more of their, their time and energy. Uh, so you guys can be praying for, for us over there in Stockholm. Let's continue. Södertälje. So as you see, that's, that's how you say it. Södertälje. So that's, 
that's kind of the phonetic, phonetic way. Uh, we're a leader group. There's two families there, Donna and, uh, Donna and David Ulstedt, as well as Mikael and Susan Siedmalm. It's an international group. We have from the Philippines, we have from Africa, we have uh, from the Middle East. So it's really a different type of, uh, a type of uh, country there. So it's like it's its own. Uh, there's a lot of Syrian Orthodox who live over there. So it's, they have their own traditions as well. Uh, I'm really blessed to be able to live over there, to help out over there. And, uh, and everyone is really part of the community. We're only 27, so it's truly like a body. Everyone is needed. If someone's not there, it's felt. Like they, it's, we are part of the same body. Everyone helps out. All the brothers preach, which I think is so amazing, you know, being able to stand up in front of a crowd and, and talk to family. Um, all the, everyone does and helps with the welcome, helps with communion. We have groups that, that mix, that uh, change depending on, uh, for, the, for the food, for example. So we have three different groups that keep switching. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, continue on to the other Nordic countries. We have Iceland. Iceland is only a small house church over there. We have Yuan and Torhildur. Those two are, uh, have just recently moved to help take care of their aging mom. And we already had three other disciples over there. So they became a house church. They decided to, to be together, learn to love each other, learn to love one another. And, um, and they had an evangelistic event with Douglas Jacoby, as you can see on the, on the slide, uh, where they had six guests. So, yeah, continuing on to Denmark. Denmark. It's uh, a church of 27 and 50% of the church is actually in the leader group. So they're working on how to be a church. They don't have any staff over there. So they're just trying to help each other out and bear the burden and share the burden simply. So it's really cool what they're doing. One amazing brother over there called Stian. There you go. Stian Oke Johannesson. He's, uh, he got inspiration from the Tallinn teaching ministry in 2022 and decided, why don't we have something for the Nordics as well? So he began a Nordic teaching ministry. He sent out a, a, a paper where he, first he asked people, are you guys interested in joining? And then he sent out a newsletter. And a really cool uh, development there is Dr. Steve Kennard is going to start helping uh, them train Nordic disciples interested in becoming church building teachers. It's ideas to expand the group to maybe 15 to 20 people, get a bunch of young people, even from the Baltics, as well as the Nordics, so just as many as possible can join, uh, just to, you know, to praise God, to learn how not just teaching is not just philosophical and mental, but also practical. How do we do this in a church-building way? How do, we, how do we expand the church? How do we, you know, praise God in that way? So, uh, right on. There's been... There's been even without staff, there's been teen baptisms. We've had Jens and Elizabeth, 15 years old, both of them. And here's also a few different things that they like to do. Spaghetti Tuesdays. They have women's DYI nights. They have movie nights. They do winter bathing over there. Great for the system to shock the system and wake it up. They do uh, hope activities. So they help out volunteering, um, you know, giving gifts for, to the poor, giving gifts to kids who have, don't have parents, who don't have support from parents, and, uh, and a lot of traveling in between. Just recently, just last month, a group of teens from the Denmark church traveled to Finland to go, to go get encouragement and encourage the church over there. All right, next up we got Norway. Norway is 94 disciples, and the oldest is 82 years old over there. Uh, there's a lot of teenagers, and since 2018, there haven't been full-time staff either there. So... They've, they've uh, been in a process, you know, how to develop passionate relationship with God and how everyone in the church can use their gift to, uh, to build a church. Um, and the idea, again, they want to have a lot of transparency. They want everyone to be involved and know what is going on. Uh, so I was really uh, impressed like what Bruce said. Like, it's great to know where the money is going. You know, it's good for you guys to understand. Th this is the countries. These are the things that are happening. And this is what, what we're doing, you know. So, uh, loved by God, Elsket of Gud, that's their theme for the year. Uh, and the idea is, again, that God gets to know them through a relational focus. And we function as a family. So, that's their, their theme for this year. So, you guys can pray for that. Uh, they have teens that organize groups and trips. A lot of, uh, they give them a lot of independence to do that type of thing themselves. 
there's a really cool couple who live in a little town called Nilhammar, where they have a farm. And that farm is where they do teen camp. So they've had, you know, 18, 18 teenagers participating at that teen camp. God still works. We have another baptism. Um, her name is, her name is, uh, last name was Buvarp. Her name is Pauline, the daughter of the Buvarp. And uh, yeah, that's up for, for Norway. Let's continue on to Finland. So Finland is three different, three different uh, churches that, sorry, three different cities that are one church, Helsinki. And, and there's 38 people in the church. Most are older, but a recent development is that new disciples are, be, are being born into or are being baptized into the faith. Here's the leadership team. We have Peter and Magdalena Heyer on the left side over there. We have Marco and, Tan and Tanya Lakonen on the right side over there. They're the leadership team. They're working tirelessly. I must say, Peter and Magdalena, they're, so, they have, they're full of zeal. They're full of fire, and they really love the Lord. And they're, they're working tirelessly over there to, to keep the relationship, build, and, uh, and preach the word. Uh, so, yeah, we also have the church planner, Sanna. Uh, Tan, uh, yes, Sanna Titta, the church planner, and Ilva Lindqvist, who's the hope representative. We have Eliezer, what Bruce was saying, this is the guy that you guys are helping support. He's the engine of energy over there in Finland. That's what Peter called him, and I, and I love it. Uh, he's really done a great work with the teens, helping connect them and, and build relationships within the teen group. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really cool. We have also Felicia Heyer, that's uh, their daughter, Peter and Magdalena's daughter. She's also a youth sister representative. So the teens over there, they, they actually... They actually take care of one service per month. So they do the welcome, the communion, the sermon, the worship, the thank yous, the announcements and all that. So they're actually taking care of one sermon a month or one you know, full church uh, a month. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, right on. We had two baptisms over there in February. And you know, we have the Russia-Ukraine war going on and a lot of Ukrainian refugees and even Russian Russians come over to Finland, um, and, and they don't speak the language. So it's been quite tough to reach out to them, but, but Peter has reached out to a guy called Steven who got baptized. He's a 17-year-old, he's a sorry, he's a 20-year-old who got baptized, and he learned English so quickly that he started helping translate to others, to others from Ukraine, others from Russia. So he ended up baptizing his friend, Alec, uh, so, which is... Which is a, a, a blessing. Which is a it's a miracle, really. Like how he how he just continued to 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 fight the good fight and just you know love others, reach out to others. So it's amazing that we get one baptism and from there bring your friends and come and see you know what God can do. Yeah, so it's really cool how how God works. All right, N uh, we're the Nordic House Church Leaders Retreat in Oslo. We had it in November 2023 where we all gathered from all the different Nordic churches in Oslo to try to see where do we want to go next year? What do we want to do? And we, we have visions of, um, of seeing a multi-generational church, you know, of, of, a, of how to reach the youth more and, and having generations in love with the Bible where everyone's talents are used. So that's, um, so that's a little bit about that. Uh, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about me. So uh, like I said, I was born in Sweden. I lived in three different countries growing up. So growing up, I went to international school. And during my, you know, my high school years, came back in uh, 2003 for university. And the only constants were my parents. You know, that was really it. My mom was part of the church and my dad wasn't. And growing up, I, you know, I went to Sunday school. And as a young teen, I found like science explained so much to me. It explained so much that I decided I don't need God. That's kind of how I, how I viewed it. But the truth is, science explains the how, but not the why. It doesn't explain why we do certain things. Science is great at explaining how. And I had a lot of questions, and I, and I was argumentative, and I asked, and I didn't really feel like I got, got good answers. And so the Bible became like a bunch of stories for me. It just became a bunch of fairy tales. You know, when, when that happened, it also started to, to break my moral ground, you know, because with the Bible, we have a real moral law that we can stand firm on. And of course, we learn from our parents that we're not supposed to lie and cheat and all that stuff. But what happens when you grow is that you think, well, if I do, then I get ahead. 
right? So why don't I do certain things? Why don't I lie and cheat? And, and so without God, without having that, that higher, you know, authority, I just, I, I went the wrong way. You know, I started to, to break away from, from all that, and my, and my life started to, to spiral in, in very negative and self-destructive ways. Uh, so, yeah, removing, you know, I, uh, I ended up getting in trouble with the police. I ended up uh, uh, hurting people. Relationships were destroyed in a lot of ways. And I look back and I think, wow, you know, it's selfish. It's downright selfish. I was so stubborn. I said, there is no God and I want to do what I want to do. I didn't want to follow a bunch of rules. I didn't understand that it was a relationship that God wants from me. He doesn't, he doesn't just want, you know, you to follow A, B, C and that's it, get to heaven, you know. So, so it's cool because now when I'm, I've been a disciple for five years, I've started to look at the Old Testament and understand that there's a lot of amazing things, you know, in the, in the Old Testament. A lot of wisdom there to be, to be gleaned from. And so that's, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking about today, Joseph's story specifically. And, you know, through Joseph's story, I've heard it being told to me like, yeah, if you are faithful to God, he will bless you. That's kind of what I, what I understood. People told me like, yeah, look, Joseph, he, uh, he went through all this trouble and, uh, and he was faithful to God. So God blessed him. You know, we all know the story. You know, he was the faithful son. He was hated by his brothers, right? They put him in a pit. They sold him to slavery. And then he goes from, uh, from slavery to Potiphar's house. And from Potiphar's house, he, he gains uh, stature, he gains power, but then he gets into jail. And then in jail, he, he decodes some dreams. And then he gets into, uh, into a Pharaoh's house, and he becomes second in command there. So it's, it's understandable to think, well, look, yeah, this story, you know, if you're faithful, then God blesses you. But I'd like to tell you guys that, no, this is, this is not the moral of the story. This is not the point of the story. And it's so easy to miss certain verses. When we, read the, when we read the Bible, it's there. It's in front of us, you know, and it's amazing. Every time I read, I find something new. I find something new that I can learn. And, it, and it's so, it's so um, you know, current to your, to your life today. It's alive and active, like it says. So it's cool to know that Egypt was the greatest nation in the world at that time. It was truly the, the most technological, the richest. You know, it was it, being second in command in a country like that. It's kind of like being vice president here, I would say. You know, it's, it's really a high position that Joseph reached. And, uh, and that's, in that's important to, to have in perspective that Joseph, he gained some serious power, some serious riches. Yeah. Let's continue. See the different, uh, the different dreams that he had, you know. Joseph had, had three pairs of dreams. The first pair... You know, he shared with his brothers, he shared with his father, and the dad's like, what? We're going to bow down to you? What is that? I don't, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Uh, and um, he got the favorite robe. You know, we know that Joseph was, was the favorite son. Uh, and so they decided to, to kill him. But thankfully, one of the brothers, Reuben, said, hey, let's just sell this guy into slavery. It's no, no reason to kill him. And then later on, he gets, he gets into the... Into the uh, into the prison, and he has two pairs of dreams, two servants of Pharaoh. He interprets those dreams, right? There's the butler and the baker, or the cupbearer and the baker. So we had three, three baskets and three cups, and one is a positive dream, and one is a negative dream. Right? One is, you're going to become, you're going to go back into power. The other says, you're going to die. You're going to get your job back. You're not going to make it. And uh, then, of course, the last dream from Pharaoh. You guys remember that dream, right? You had seven cows. Sick cows, healthy cows. You have the, the sick corn and the healthy corn. And the sick corn eats the healthy corn. And the sick cows eat the healthy cows. Right? And that, Joseph understood that this, or God showed him. You know, the, God showed him that the healthy, the, the seven years, seven means seven years of, of, uh, of great growth in the country. And then you're going to have seven years of famine. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So what do you do? Joseph's a pretty, pretty smart guy. He's like, well, you've got to store up this grain. You've got to store up. For seven years, you have to store up. And then you can have enough grain for the times of famine. And let's pick it up from here. Let's, uh, let's read from Genesis 41, verse 37. You know? And let's not assume the story, because there's a lot of irony in this story. All right. All 
right, so we're going to read a few excerpts there. Genesis 41, verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? And this is kind of ironic. You know, Pharaoh's saying to Joseph that, wow, the spirit of God is in you. I mean, Joseph interpreted some dreams to his brothers, and they didn't think that. They're like, we're going we're gonna to put you to, we're going to try to kill you. You know, and, and now he stands before this pagan king. You know, Pharaoh doesn't believe in Yahweh. He doesn't believe in that. He, had, he believed he was a god, for that matter. Right? And he's telling, wow, this guy has the spirit of God in him. So Pharaoh, and then verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And you know, God promised Israelites Canaan as their land. That's what God promised the Israelites. Here Joseph is, and he's getting Egypt. It's the wrong land. It's not in the right place. It's ironic, you know. Verse 44, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphanath Paneah. Wrong name. We see that God changes people's names. Here is Pharaoh changing Joseph's name. It's not good. Verse 45, what did he do? He gave, Pharaoh gave Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went through, throughout the land of Egypt. Wrong wife. You know, not only a pagan, you know, she's the daughter of a priest. You know, we're not meant to be unequally yoked. And this has nothing to do with, uh, with ethnicity or nationality. Remember, Moses, he married a Cushite woman. And she was uh, today's Ethiopia, we call it. But because of their theology, that's the issue. So this is a problem. So the story is telling me right now, if I were to read it this way, that if you're faithful, you can end up in the wrong land. You can end up with the wrong father, Pharaoh, instead of God. You can end up with the wrong wife, you know, with the wrong robes. Hallelujah, right? Uh-oh, right? It's not okay. It's not, it's not correct according to Moses. And like I said, it's so easy to gloss off certain verses because Joseph understood this. He understood that he wasn't in the right place. All right? So we're going to pick it up from verse 50. We're going to jump over there to verse 50. Amen. Verse 50. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is, because God, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. You know, despite being in Egypt, Joseph still trusts God. He trusts the promises made to him and his family. He's faithful. He is so faithful to God that he gives his sons Hebrew names. And let's look a bit closer at the names. Manasseh, the first name. It's causing to forget. Let it go. You know? And when we think of forget, we think that we, we completely erase it from memory. But no, it's more like, ah, oh, we, we choose to not focus on it. That's kind of what forget means. You know? When we say, ah, oh, no, don't worry about that. I forgot about that. So of course we remember it, but we just, it's not important. And that's what Joseph is saying here. Saying, I named him Manasseh because God made me forget all my trouble. I'd like you guys to imagine a story. I'd like you guys to imagine Zaphonath Paneah, Joseph, talking to a fellow Egyptian. You know, Hello, Zaphonath Paneah. Lovely day today. I see that you and your lovely pagan wife have had a child. Congratulations. Man, you are living the dream. You, you came as a slave to this country. You rose to the second hand, second in command in Pharaoh. You have a chariot. You got a Rolls Royce. You have all the riches. You have all the power. No one does anything without your say-so. You're in control of all the grain. You got all the food. So, 
you know, my, my slaves, they, they look at you and they say, wow, I can look up to, jo- to, to Zaphonath Paneah. I can look up to you and say, if I work hard, I could also be blessed like you. So what did you name your child? Manasseh. Oh, that sounds, that sounds Jewish. It sounds Hebrew. It is. Well, why, why would you give your child a Hebrew name? Well, because I am a Hebrew. And Pharaoh can change my name, but he can't change my kid's name. But, but why would you name your, your name after the Hebrew people who, who abandoned you? Because I let that stuff go. Did, didn't they sell you to slavery? That's right. I let that go. But they never, they never came looking for you. They never came to try to find you again. You're right. I forgot about that. You know, Joseph, he chose to be identified with God's people. He chose to be identified with the covenant people of God, as opposed to be identified with the enemies of God. He chose to view his life through this lens of God's promises. He let go of his past pain. You know, like I had to let go of my, my obstinate view of science as the answer. I had to let that go. And it, and it wasn't easy. It hurt. I didn't want to let it go. But it was hurting me. You know, like I said, I, I ended up in trouble with the police. I, I had a depression that lasted for six years. Because I refused to believe. I had to let that go. You know, so many relationships I've destroyed on my, on my time here on earth. So many people I've hurt. It took, you know, it took my mom getting cancer and my dad getting Alzheimer's for me to start to realize, wait, they matter to me. And, and my view of science is like, well, nothing matters, right? I mean, science says that it happened all randomly. It happened by chance. And if that was the case, then nothing actually matters. But no, there is a, there is a meaning. They matter to me. My parents matter to me. I even got my dream job at the time. That mattered too. That was, that was a good thing in all of this, but it mattered. And that, and that changed. That changed the way I viewed it. You know, it took another disciple teaching me about the Bible, about the New Testament, showing me the historical context, understanding that history and science are two ways of truth. It's not just, you know, not just one. History is, is true, and the New Testament is so archaeologically bounded it's so attested to there's so much evidence that it's right and and this guy is saying that he's god in the bible he's saying that i am the way the truth and the life and it took me to let go of my of my pride to let go of the way i viewed science as the truth the way the life and decided well you know what if if this guy is real then i'm going to try to pray i'm going to try to read my bible i'm going to try to memorize some scripture and i want to see what happens because there must be power in this book. And, and by God, I got peace. I never understood peace before in my life. It was, it was truly, I didn't know what to expect, but that was, that was amazing. In, in, this, in the entire turmoil, everything going around, everything happening, I got peace. So, um, amen. Yeah. You know, God, he gets closer to those who seek him. That's also something I learned. Like, it's, it's true. There are, there are all these promises in the Bible. You know, God seeks those who seek him. You know, he will draw close, draw close to him and he will draw close to you. I bet you guys can, can feel that as well at times. Sometimes, it, 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 ah, I don't feel God close to me or, you know, it's even happened to me lately. And I know that he works even if I don't feel him, even if it's not an emotional thing, I can see that he works. Because I asked him, you know, I asked God, please, just recently, just a month ago, I'm like, God, I'm not feeling you. What, what is this? W- you know, can you, can you help me show you, like, show me, show me something? And I, a- and, I was, and I was pushed to take a walk that day, and I took a walk outside. I said I didn't want to take a walk, but I decided, no, I need to go out. And I met a, I met a friend I haven't seen in 15 years, you know, a guy that I, that I used to get into trouble with. And, uh, and he's walking with a baby, one-year-old. And I'm like, is that you? And he wants to know about Jesus. He wants to know about God. 
And I, and I looked up and I said, God, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel you, but I see you work. I see that you're doing things, you know. So it's really cool. It's really cool how, how he does that. And, and, and I want to I tell you guys, you know, some of us, we need a manasa. We need to let things go. I don't know, I don't know you guys, your family. It's awesome. But I don't know what you guys have that maybe you're not letting go of. If there's something in your heart, maybe something last week, or maybe it's 15 years ago. Something that you need to let go of. We all need a Manasseh, you know. We all need to let go of, of a bitterness towards each other, towards something that's going on. We need to let it go. You know, so Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice, he will cover it. His blood will cover all the problems, all the sin. He will cover so that was my, my first point, Manasseh, let it go. All right? Let's, uh, let's look at the second name, Ephraim. It's another Hebrew name, right? And, and what does it say? God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I mean, wouldn't the land of Joseph's affliction be the place where they hated him, where they wanted to murder him? Wouldn't that be the land of affliction? No, no Joseph says. He understands that Egypt is the land of his affliction because he identifies himself with part of God's people. Anywhere outside of God's presence is the land of affliction, all right? Anywhere outside of it. If we look around us right now, this land that we're in, this is the land of our affliction, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. This is not it. This is not where God is right now, right? You know, any day here, the best day here, pales in comparison with any day in eternity, in any day with God. You know, we're, we're citizens of God, God's kingdom. We're not citizens of, of the U.S., not citizens of Sweden. We see how, how Joseph responds to this reality. You know, he doesn't say, oh, well, since I'm not, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, I guess I'll just sit here and do nothing. That's, that's not what he does. Right? He, he knows, well, God put me here. I got I to gotta do what I got to do. God gave me these gifts. I'm going to use them. And I'm going to keep praising God. And I'm going to keep believing in him and trusting in him. And God blessed him in different ways. He was also put in prison for a few years, right? He was also sold into slavery, but he never forgot that. Well, whether I'm up or down, I'm not at the end stage. I'm not with God yet. I am in the land of my affliction right now. You know, he understood there has to be a reason God put him there. He understood that innately. He understood. And even if you don't understand why your situation is how it is right now, well, this isn't the end stop. Whether it's good or bad, this is the land of our affliction. You know, we, we understand this thing as Christians. We get this pull between two worlds, you know, this one and the one to come. Reminds me of Paul in Philippians 121. He writes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. He wants to be with God, but right now he's, he's working and there's producing fruitful labor for him. We're pulled between two worlds. We're pulled between heaven and, which is, and our home sweet home, that point number two on the screen. But during this time here, we must keep doing God's will. We must keep doing those good works that he has prepared for us beforehand. All right? Whether you're your head chemist or a lab assistant. You gotta keep doing it. You know, whether you're a CEO or you're the cleaner, it doesn't matter. All right? Let's not get comfortable in this material world. No, let's, no matter how good, again, no matter how good or bad, this isn't the end, guys. This isn't the end, brothers and sisters. You know, a good fr uh, American friend of mine, Shane, he's leading the church back there uh, in Sweden. He's saying that the culture is, is changing and, you know, things are happening around us with. The, politics and even world uh, politics is going and it's a good reminder that all this is noise it's not the main thing 
It's not the real thing, you know. You got to hold on to that. You know, guys, like, like where am I from? Personally, I'm, I, I don't look Swedish, right? I'm born in Sweden, but I don't look Swedish. But I realize, like, this is, you know, I'm God's child. I'm, I'm, in, I'm from God's kingdom, not this one. So, you know, I, I've been with my name, Elias Saba. You know, Saba isn't a very Swedish last name. Elias can, can be, uh, but... People were telling me when I, when I finished my degree and I was trying to find work, they would say, well, hey, I, I think it's your last name, Elias. Your last name, it doesn't, it's not Swedish. So that's why you're not getting jobs here. You know, I ended up working in oil and gas at that time, out, out the country. So there is prejudice. There's prejudice everywhere. You know, but thankfully, this isn't, this isn't the end. We're not, we're not what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to go to heaven, guys. So let's keep working for that. Let's keep doing things for that. Yeah. A friend of mine, Martin, he felt the same. He got baptized uh, recently, and he was a typical Swede, atheist. He, and he also, he was, his parents were from Iran, so he didn't look very Swedish. But he felt that. He felt like, I'm not, I'm not home. I need to move somewhere else. He went to Italy. He went to Egypt. He ended up meeting the church over in Italy. And when he heard that there are Christians in Sweden, he's like, I can't believe that. <laughs> so he came over. <laughs> I met with him, I got to study the Bible with him, and he was so glad to, to hear the same answers to his questions. It's like, you guys are saying the same thing. We're like, well, we got the Bible. It says it in there, you know. You know, some things are complicated, some things are very simple. So, amen to that. So, what's the point of Joseph's story? We can go to Genesis 45, and we see... And we see it says, and, do, and now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Why? Well, to show you what happens when you're faithful. No, that's not what it says. You know, to show, it, show that God blesses you if you're faithful. And no, it says, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 6, for two years now there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. So Joseph says, God sent me here to save you. Joseph realized that he was put there to save the Hebrews, to save the Israelites. That was his purpose. So he's like, yeah, now I see what God had in store. I had no idea. And that's usually how it is for us. We don't know what God is planning. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And he saw, this is, this is the reason I am here. This is his sacrifice. And you know, my, my mom, she, she got cancer. And she told a friend of mine that if it took me getting cancer to see my, my son and my husband get baptized, I'm glad. You know, and that's tough. It's tough for me. I, you know, I want her here, but I know at least where she is. And that's... You know, it, it took me 33 years, and I don't know, most of you guys, some of you guys have kids. Maybe they're in the faith, maybe they're not, but don't give up hope, guys. Keep praying, keep loving them, keep doing what you're doing. And, and it's so cool to see how my mom really loved so many people. Like, so many people came to me. People I had no idea about. She touched everyone, even, you know, from work. Even when she was sick in the hospital, she would talk about Jesus to the, to the doctors, to the nurses. You know, saying my faith. It, it kept her, you know, she was only supposed to live one year. She lived for two years. I got a full extra year with my mom. So uh, there is a plan, guys. When, when God is in the equation, there is a meaning to it, all right? Make sure to keep having him in the equation. All right. Last thing I'd like to share uh, in, verse, in, in Genesis 46. Now it's Jacob, so it's Joseph's father. And I, and I think this is an amazing connection because in Genesis 46 verse 3 it says do not be afraid now again God is speaking to Jacob here do not be afraid to go down to Egypt he's telling the dad for I will make you into a great nation I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again this idea that that God came on earth Jesus came down to us here on earth and why what did he do that for so he could bring us back to heaven again so, 
there's always a plan. Again, there is a meaning. You know, my name, my name is the, my name is Elias Saba, and I'm I'm Swedish, but not really. I'm part of God's kingdom in the end. Yeah. So God put us here for a reason. I don't know you guys, like I said, very well, but Jesus' blood has to been able to cover all the sins, all the issues, all the problems. Give us, give it up to God. Make sure to give it to Him. Manasseh, let it go. Thank you very much. Bless you. Thank you. Bless. All glory to God. Amen. I'd like to go ahead and invite the uh, singers up on stage as we uh, close out here. I think we have a slide showing this year's uh, special missions uh, contribution that we're taking up on June 16th. You know, in Acts chapter 16, it says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul had seen the vision. He got ready to leave at once for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And I think in a real way, uh, God has shown us a vision of what's going on in the Baltic and Nordic states uh, and sent a man who's, who, who's saying, come help us. Uh, you know, we, we, we live in an atheist country. We have a foothold, 27 people here, 90 here, 27 there. We have a foothold in these countries, but help us. Uh, uh, give us some financial help. Uh, some of us have been able to go over and visit. I know Manny went last summer, and the, the Kellys have been over, and uh, Greg goes over, and others will have chances. We're trying to bring some of the, uh, uh, the Nordic uh, countries here, bring their teens to come over and do teen camp with us. You know, teens need that, that larger party. But it all takes money, and uh, there's a great coalition. I got to s sit in the meetings the last couple days. Great coalition of churches in Milwaukee and in, uh, in Washington. Uh, and us that are all pooling together to, uh, to help uh, Norway and Sweden and the Baltic states. So I, I know the church will really rally. Uh, it's been special to uh, hear from a missionary who's, who's doing it uh, daily, and God's enriching his faith, uh, and we'll be enriched as we help uh, these countries continue to uh, propagate the gospel. Amen. Thank you, brother, for putting your heart out there today. So there's a, here's our landing point. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've already begun giving. I think we're up to 11,000. We're trying to raise 110,000, 11 times our, our weekly contribution. Uh, and so officially we kick it off in June, but uh, a lot of us like to give after our taxes come in and that sort of thing. And so uh, we're going to send 50 to 55,000 over to the, the Baltic Nordics. Uh, we're continuing to help Bakersfield up the road. Uh, this year, we're uh, reaching out to Santa Barbara. We sent the Kellys out there, and we're sending some money out there to, to really rebuild that church. And uh, this summer, uh, we're going to continue to have our uh, local mission internship to our teens and campus. So uh, please uh, be praying about what you want to give, and uh, go ahead and, and begin giving online if you uh, choose to. Uh, but let's go ahead and be standing and celebrate this service with a final song. Amen. Go ahead and stand up. Um, and before we begin, I want to say we're going to sing Encourage My Soul, but I, I want to point out some of the things that encouraged me today. I, it, was, it was like a blast through the past today. My day started, and I, and I want to give some honor here to uh, Kathy Moresti. I, I ran into my brother Jacob, and I saw him processing his grief, and I thought how special that is that we have someone like Kathy that can help us through things like that. That's encouraging. Listening to Bruce, I just have to laugh because Bruce and I, we, we have the same experience. I was met just a few hundred miles south of him in a subway in the same fashion and exact same thing happened, right? So he was in England and I was in Germany and uh, God brought us both back to the States. Uh, and then Elias, I mean, I, I only laugh and we had a good laugh the other day too, but some of those pictures up there, are some of my friends from Europe when we were all a slight bit younger as singles. Um, and they're all just married with kids now. But I do want to say, once again, public apology to my congregation. Um, I've managed to cut my finger off again, and so you will be without drums for a few more weeks. Okay, but on that, let's get encouraged by singing Encourage My Soul. my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home thanks be the God the morning light 
touch my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home thanks be to God the morning The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, the storm is passing over. Amen. Have a blessed week.